In this video, I'm gonna talk about a tool which perfume is used not only to understand the composition and the quality of their natural raw materials, but a tool which they can even use to recreate other perfumes. And that tool is called GCMS. So if you wanna find out about GCMS and how it works and how perfumers use it, then watch this video. This video is sponsored by Luxeterra, my online store where you can find all of the essential equipment for perfumery. Only good quality and good value for money products make the cut and I use almost all of the products myself when making perfumes for my brand. To browse the full range of products, visit www.lux-terra.co.uk or click the link in the description. GCMS then, what exactly is it? Well, GCMS was invented in the 1950s and it very quickly became one of the most important tools in the perfumes arsenal possibly the most important analytical tools aside from, well, your nose itself. So what is it and what does it stand for? Well, GCMS is an acronym which stands for Gas Chromatography Mass Spectrometry. And I'll explain exactly what that means. So what exactly is it? Well, it's a big machine and it basically consists of four components. So firstly, you have your sample injector. And then secondly, you have a long winding coil. And then after that, you have your detector and that's for the gas chromatogram part. And then at the end of that, you have your mass spectrometry part, which is another machine attached to the end of it, which is called a mass spectrometer. So essentially you have these four sections. So now I'll go into a bit more detail and explain exactly what they do. So first you have your, your liquid sample, and that should be a liquid of volatile compounds. And that's perfect for perfumery because that's pretty much exactly what perfume is. So you take your uh, sample and you make sure it's diluted and then you go and inject that, or that's done by the machine, into this big coil. Now inside this coil, you have an inert gas which is traveling through it. And inert just means a non-reactive gas, so it's kind of like a carrier. Now the walls of this tube are actually lined with an adsorbent material. And what that means is when your sample starts traveling through the tube with this gas, the sample can actually go and adsorb, and can go and stick to the sides of the walls for a little while, and then what happens is all of this goes in equilibrium. So imagine you're a little molecule inside, you're floating around in the gas, you're going through the tube along with the gas, and then you might hit a wall and then you might stick there for a bit, and then eventually you'll go back into the gas and you'll keep flowing along. Now it turns out that different molecules have different affinities for the walls compared to the gas. So some molecules like to stay in the gas and they don't like sticking to the walls, whereas some molecules like to stick to the walls, but they don't like to stay in the gas. So what that means is over time, the molecules that like to stay in the gas, because they spend longer in the gas and the gas is moving through this tube, those molecules actually move through the whole tube quicker towards the detector, whereas the molecules which prefer the walls, they take a lot longer because it's only occasionally that they're actually in the gas and able to travel through it. So then, what happens from the point of view of the detector is the detector is kind of sitting there at the end of the column and all of these molecules are coming past. So every time a molecule comes past, the detector goes and records um, how much of that molecule came past and it also goes and records the time since it was injected in originally. Because remember, everything was injected at the same time, but everything's coming out at different times. And with that, it plots a graph. So you get a graph with the bottom or the x-axis is the time, the retention time. So the time that everything was in the column. And then you start getting these peaks along the graph. So every time you can imagine that um, as you're moving through time, every time a molecule comes out, then that detector, which is measuring how much of something's coming out, does a spike suddenly when something's come out. And then suddenly there's a gap, nothing else is coming out and then the next thing comes out. So you get this graph in the end, which is a load of peaks, and each peak corresponds to an individual component or a certain molecule that was found in that mixture. Okay then, so that's the gas chromatography part of the machine. But at that point, you've got all these peaks, but you don't necessarily know exactly what they are. So this is where the mass spectrometry comes in. You see, before the mass spectrometry, you could have had a perfumer sitting at the end of the machine trying to smell the things as they came out, trying to work out what each one is. For example, oh, that smells like uh, linalool, that smells like limonene. But of course you need a skilled perfumer for that and that's quite time consuming and it's also prone to error. Well, when they invented mass spectrometry, well, that's another machine that you can put on the end of the gas chromatogram. So a mass spectrometer is essentially a machine where you take your molecule and you bombard it with a load of electrons and that splits it into all of these fragments. And you have a detector which essentially detects the mass to charge ratio. You don't really need to worry about that, but it's just a detector which can detect the different fragments 
and the each molecule that you put into the mass spectrometer, it produces a unique fingerprint of fragments. So what they've done is they've done it for a load of known molecules and they've put them all in a database. And if you have a, a fragment pattern or fingerprint made by the max spectrometer for a specific molecule, you can go look that up in a database of known fragment patterns and that should be able to tell you what your molecule was. Because the gas chromatography has already split the sample into its separate components, now all that has to happen is that they go through successively as a single component into that mass spectrometer. So that mass spectrometer can go through all of those peaks as they come in and work out what they are. So essentially at the end of this whole process, what you're left with is a graph of peaks showing the intensity and hopefully labeling from a mass spectrometer as to what those peaks might be. And this is essentially all a gas chromatogram is. Now, here comes the question of interpretation. You see, if you had a very simple perfume, say it was just made of eight aroma chemicals, say it was a nice beginner perfume that I got and made um, following a tutorial on this channel, for example, and it just had eight aroma chemicals, no naturals in it. Well, then if I put that through the GCMS, the GCMS will probably pretty accurately be able to tell you each of those eight aroma chemicals and how much of them each one is. So it essentially tells you the whole formula of the perfume. The thing is, however, when you start having naturals, you've got to remember that a natural raw material, something like an absolute or an essential oil, is already made up of many, probably hundreds of individual components because it's kind of nature's mixture of molecules. And the same also happens to some degree if you're using kind of perfume bases. So things like the uh, Feminish or Givaudan uh, bases or any kind of pre-made accord you might buy in from somewhere and use in your perfumes. Um, this machine, the GCMS, it's only going to show you the individual molecules. It doesn't know, for example, that Rose Absolute or Lemon Essential Oil is made from all of these individual components. So then, what do you do if you look at your GCMS trace and it's got loads and loads of kind of chemicals or aroma chemicals, things that you can see are obviously constituents, um, say for essential oils, but you don't quite know what they are. And often this is if you see a load of terpenes, for example, um, you can see there's some things which are obviously aroma chemicals, but then there are some things which you would never really usually use in perfumery on their own, but they're often present um, as a component of essential oils. So things like pinene or thujopsine, um, there are loads of these little things and you find them usually as components of things like essential oils. So if you're a skilled perfumer or a skilled kind of GCMS technician, you may be able to kind of recognize the presence of some of these and that's just because you've looked at so many of these GCMS graphs in the past that you can actually pick up the patterns like, oh, there's a load of kind of citral and a load of limonene. Um, there's probably some lemon essential oil in there and that's just due to you knowing already the kind of composition of these essential oils uh, in your head. The other thing is you'll find that for some raw materials, um, you'll sometimes find that they have a certain component that's actually quite indicative of that raw material and that's because you would never really use that on its own in perfumery or you would never really also find it in another raw material. So for example, in Styrax you have the component styrene and you wouldn't really go and put styrene in your perfume usually on its own and you don't really find it um, often in other raw materials. So if you see styrene, you can have a good guess that there's probably some styrax in there or maybe one of the few other raw materials that contain it. So that's kind of how you can start working out. So you can think of it as a bit of a problem to solve. You have this graph with a load of things that might be known. So for example, in a perfume, if you see Isui Super and Hedione, you probably know that those are just there as aroma chemicals. But then if you go and see some uh, beta pinene, then it's more of a problem because you think, well, there is a chance that they may have just put pinene in the perfume as a raw material, but what's more likely is it's probably a component of one of the naturals, so like an absolute or a CO2 or an essential oil or something like that. Um, and then it's your job to see what other components there are in the GC trace and work out what um, the essential oils that they might have put in might be. So the point I'm trying to explain with all this is GCMS is no silver bullet. It really depends on the difficulty of the perfume you're trying to analyze, i.e. if it's just made of simple aroma chemicals or if it's got lots of complex and especially rare naturals, because in that case, it's gonna be difficult even for the most experienced kind of GCMS technician or perfumer. And then of course, the other aspect is actually the skill of the person doing the analysis. So if you're new to this, you may have trouble, but if you're quite experienced, you may be able to pick out some of those naturals. So 
GCMS is a useful tool, but it also does require some skill in order to be able to use it correctly. Finally then, what can you do if you want to look at GCMS reports for yourself at home? Well, there are a number of reasons why you might want to do this. And the first reason is, well, you may be interested in what constitutes your raw materials if you use a lot of naturals. Maybe you want to try to recreate one as your own accord or your own base, or maybe you're just interested as to what's inside of it. Well, in this case, some raw material suppliers do actually give GCMS reports online. So there's one called Revive and another one called Eden Botanicals, which for some of their products, they give a GCMS in their COA or Certificate of Analysis section. Now, if you find the GCMS report for one version of the raw material from one manufacturer, usually it's pretty similar for other manufacturers. Obviously, there's always gonna be differences in the composition of things like essential oils because it depends on things like the climate that they were grown in, the harvest and production, distillation, those kind of things. But in general, they will be fairly similar because at the end of the day, they're coming from the same species and roughly produced in the same way. So that's how you can get it for a lot of naturals. For some other things, maybe you can't find it anywhere from a supplier. There are also scientific papers um, in scientific journals, which sometimes have these as well. Um, and that's, for example, imagine you're like a botanist or someone, um, or you know, you're interested in kind of essential oils as the science of it, and you're trying to work out what's in them for the first time ever. Say you've got like a rare essential oil, and um, then you might go and publish that in a scientific paper. So you can go and look up those things as well. If on the other hand, you're interested in GCMS for actual perfumes already in the market, for example, if you want to kind of learn a bit about how those perfumes are structured, well, these GCMS reports can be a lot harder to come by. I know that the perfumer uh, Christophe Lodamiel has released a few. Um, he definitely released one on his Instagram. So I'll put a link in to that in the description and I'll put it on the screen. Um, but there's also, um, I know that Perfumers World offer a service where you can send in a sample and they will uh, send you back the GCMS report for a fee. And they also offer a service where they can go and interpret that for you as well to make it easy to understand if you're not too confident in doing it yourself. Now, aside from that, I also saw another website uh, called Creative Formulas, and it seems like they have uh, GCMS reports for popular perfumes, which they've already gone and interpreted for you into a formula. So if you're interested um, in, for whatever reason, reconstructing a perfume, then you can go and look to that website because it does seem like they have some formulas for it. Now, as one final footnote, I also want to talk a bit about plagiarism and GCMS because the two things are related in a way. And that's because GCMS allows you essentially to start to copy perfumes. And you may have seen there are a lot of copycat perfume brands out there. I don't personally support this. And the reason for that is because for me as a perfumer, it's all about the art and the creativity of creating perfume. And then when you go and put that perfume on the market to sell it, you're essentially kind of selling the artwork that you created. You're not just selling the um, actual things you put together, but you're also selling that creative input. And of course that kind of funds you then to go and be more creative and produce more of that art. So more people can go and enjoy uh, new creations that you make. And the copycat brands, which go and undercut the main brands, um, but trying to sell themselves as that perfume, I don't think is an ethical business practice. And the reason for that is because it's essentially disincentivizing um, the creators to be creative. Now, the thing about the copycat brands is that most of the time, obviously, because it's impossible to have a 100% perfect match, they are usually um, fall a bit short anyway, and often they try to cut costs in order to make them so cheap. So in a sense, um, it kind of balances itself out a little bit because um, I think most people know that if they want the real stuff with that, pure kind of quality, then they should go to the original brand anyway. But that said, I think it's important to think about as a perfumer, if you're plagiarizing work, or if you're taking inspiration from work, and you know what you're using these GCMS reports for, because if you're going to go and use them to learn how to structure a perfume, and maybe even take some inspiration on some combinations of things that may go well together that you didn't think of before, then I think that's just a great um, kind of part of the natural process of art, because creators do that all the time. However, I think it's important because the line between uh, inspiration and plagiarism is so blurred to kind of just think about what you're doing and try to make sure that you're not plagiarizing perfumes. I think it's much better to go and release your own perfumes with your own kind of creative um, design for the perfume. At the end of the day, I think it's much better off to maintain a good level of self-respect, respect from others, and a good conscience 
and you can do that by not plagiarizing. Anyway, that's all I've got for you in this video. So I really hope you enjoyed it and you learned something about recreating perfumes. If you're interested in learning a bit more about recreating perfumes the old fashioned way, and that's through the technique of what's called matching, then definitely leave a comment down below because I may do a video on that as well in the future. And other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're interested in learning more about perfumery and seeing more videos like this, definitely subscribe to the channel because I release a new video about different topics in perfumery every week. And aside from that, have a good week and I'll see you next time.